In 1998, a new corporation was founded. Its mission would be to organize all the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. It estimates it will take 300 years before it reaches that goal. Successful companies start with very audacious goals. And there's no question that the Google organizing all the world's information uh, and making it useful was an audacious goal. And we started with the web, but we see our mission as much more than just the web. We see it as really all of the way we communicate, the way we think, so that, because there's so much of it. Google may have started out as a simple search engine, but today with applications like Android, Chrome, Wave, Picasa, Google Apps, YouTube and Google Ocean, and now even its own smartphone, it's become an internet powerhouse. This technological tsunami pours forth almost daily from its development teams located around the world. In the process, Google has become a global vacuum cleaner of digital data. It handles an estimated 20 petabytes of data every day. That's the equivalent of 130 billion photographs or 5 billion songs on an iPod. It also deals with more than a billion searches per day. And those searches leave a digital footprint of every person visiting the site. Well, one of the interesting things about Google searches is it really is a database of intentions. It is an incredible collection of what you are thinking any given moment based upon what you're searching for, based upon what you're writing in emails. And any institution who has access to that uh, can um, have power over you or potentially adversely affect you. Do you know what this might be? Does anyone know what that is? Google founders Sergey Brin and Larry Page. Wow, OK. I didn't really realize what it was when I first saw it. But this is what helped me see it. This is what we run at the office that actually runs real time. And every one of those rising dots uh, represents probably about 20, 30 searches. Their ultimate you, goal Sergey. is to make Google into an all-knowing entity. So this session is supposed to be about the future. Uh, so I thought I'd talk at least briefly about it. And to do the perfect job doing search, you really have to be smart. In fact, the ultimate search engine would be artificial intelligence. And so that's something we work on. It is somewhat ironic that they use an image of the rogue computer HAL from the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, when they are promoting such a benevolent message. Partly, we wanted to, we want to make the world a better place. If I ruled the world, every day would be the first day of spring. In just over 10 years, Google has become one of Silicon Valley's biggest and most unconventional players. In that time, it's cultivated an image of a large but benign presence. That public perception is changing. When Google began to scan and digitize millions of books, authors and publishers responded not with hurrahs, but lawsuits alleging copyright infringement. Not long after Google News was launched, Google became the target of condemnation by the print media, which accused it of destroying their ad business and being responsible for plummeting circulation revenues. But with Google's YouTube site, the music and television industries see a threatening competitor undermining their traditional methods of making money. And when Google started photographing streets, it outraged privacy advocates. Wherever or whatever Google expands into, it always seems to be accompanied by disruption and upheaval. And whenever controversy does arise, Google falls back on a corporate motto that was born out of an early Google employee's aversion to corporate speak having come from Intel, kind of had the I don't want to work at a big company uh, idea in the back of my head. And so I was interested in something that would be a little bit more provocative and a little bit more interesting and um, maybe make people a little bit uncomfortable. And so just sitting there in the meeting, I was just trying to think of, of something interesting. And so what, what popped into my mind was just don't be evil. When I came in, I thought this was a joke. I thought that it was just a way of marketing within the company. And then one day, I was sitting in the room, and I'll never forget, 
we're having a discussion about advertising, and one of the engineers named Ron pounds his fist on the table and says, that's evil. And all of a sudden, conversation stopped. It was as though everyone had jumped around the table and, and hid underneath it. And all of a sudden, it focused the conversation on whether this particular change was positive or negative for customers. We ultimately did not make the change for that reason. It's not a bad motto, but it's misplaced because it gets increasingly difficult to say that one is not evil um, when thinking about the scope of different activities that, that service providers are involved in. It's no longer just search. The search engine Google was born in that hotbed of technological innovation, the computer science department at Stanford University. Larry Page and Sergey Brin met as grad students in 1995. They had much in common. Their fathers were both college profs and their mothers were scientists. Both were born in 1973. Both grew up with and loved anything to do with computers. Our PhD program is very selective, but it's not like when they showed up the first day, I said, oh, this is the smartest person I've seen in my life. Hector Garcia Molina was one of Sergey Brin's advisors, working with him on some data mining problems. The one thing that stood out about Sergey was his age. When I got him here as a PhD student, he was 19 years old. So that was the main thing that stuck in your mind was when you saw him as this just very young kid who knew a lot and was very smart. Sergey Brin, born in Russia, was the math prodigy who loved swimming and gymnastics. Larry Page was the inventor looking to change the world. At some point, I don't know exactly when, they connected and started working together on, on the search engine. They created their earliest search engine from off-the-shelf computer components, some of which they begged and borrowed from the university. And after they maxed out their personal credit cards, they came up with some ingenious solutions to their limited finances. And then Larry discovered that he could get a better deal by buying the individual disks without the cases. Uh, and they, were, they built their own machine, and they got more storage for the same amount of money. With a structure made of toy building blocks and their secret algorithm sauce, which they called Backrub, they cobbled together a revolutionary new search engine. One could immediately see that the ordering of the pages was substantially better than what AltaVista was, was, was providing. In the mid-1990s, AltaVista, like the majority of other search engines, looked only at text ranking the results based on the number of times a keyword appeared. Larry and Sergey's search engine was far more sophisticated with a mathematical algorithm that looked at the number of links to and from internet sites. The more links, the higher the rank. The first search I ever typed into Google was Canadian exchange rate, and it gave me exactly the right information that I ever could use about the Canadian exchange rate and so on. And I was, I hate to use the word blown away, but I was blown away by the fact that I could find exactly what I wanted so quickly. I think what they realized is that working on it in the context of a university research project didn't give them the scope and the scale that they really needed to make it work. So they said, well, let's take a leave. Let's go off, do a company, get it working, and then we can come back and finish up the research. Larry and Sergey were preparing to leave Stanford to start up their search engine company, which by this time they registered as Google, a misspelling of a mathematical term for one with a hundred zeros after it. Meanwhile, they continued to participate in the computer science program. They had presented some work they had done on a search engine, and naturally given my interests, I wanted to be part of it. Google had its very first employee, Craig Silverstein, a fellow PhD candidate. So there were three of us at the beginning, and it seemed like forever that there were three of us. We cared a lot about culture fit, and there were some people who we refused to hire, even though they seemed technically to be a very, you know, very qualified, because they just did not have the personality to work well with us. The three Stanford postgrad students opened up corporate headquarters in that cliche of Silicon Valley, a garage. The company began to expand. I joined in uh, January of 1999, which was a few months after they'd started. There were four other people at the company, including Larry and Sergey at the time. And they were renting half a house from someone who was still living there and who is now a vice president at Google. And the computers, the, you know, everybody was working in 
offices or in bedrooms, if you will. And the, the garage was included and we had, I believe we had a printer there, we had a ping pong table there. Uh, but but the, the whole company was not living in the garage. We totally worked out of a garage and I made sure that we did. It was maybe one day a month or one day every two months, but I made sure that every so often we'd go out into that garage and we would do some work there. Well, I want to be able to tell people times like this that we started in the garage. And so for the record, we started in a garage. It's just in a garage that had rooms and a house attached to it. As Google outgrew its garage, it moved corporate headquarters into a regular office space in downtown Palo Alto. We were in Palo Alto back in those days, which is like a restaurant town. My goal was that we'd go to a different restaurant every night. We'd eat out dinner all the time. We'd eat out lunch all the time, in fact. The company was expanding quickly, and soon they moved again. But with few restaurants around this new location, Larry and Sergey decided that it would be more efficient and more cost-effective if they had their own kitchen with their own chef. The one who was chosen had on his resume a stint cooking for the band The Grateful Dead. They offered me shares in the very beginning, and I was very reluctant. You know, I talked to my dad about it, and I was like, Pop, these guys want me to give them money for these shares in a company that isn't public. And he's like, it's a scam. Don't believe him. Don't you give him a dime. Unlike other search sites, the Google homepage was clean and efficient, free of annoying banner ads and pop-ups. Harry Page and Sergey Brin watched as their search engine, Google, became more and more popular. But that engine still wasn't translating into real money, and they had no viable business plan to make Google turn a profit. Our founders decided that for the longest time that we weren't going to get into the ad business. However, I think the breakthrough idea came when we said, look, why don't we just show ads that are purely text-based and doesn't have any you know, moving images or distracting stuff. Based on the search, Google would provide simple ads for people to click through. So on October 2000, Google embarked on a new business, online advertising. Almost immediately, ad money started to flood in, and pressure grew on Larry and Sergey from their venture capitalist investors. They wanted an experienced CEO to run the place. Larry and Sergey chose a seasoned veteran of the tech world, Eric Schmidt. He had successfully run software maker Novell, and before that, he was with Sun Microsystems. But perhaps what was more important for the founders was that he shared with them a background as a computer science engineer, married to a strong entrepreneurial drive. Well, Google has taken the position that creativity occurs from individual entrepreneurs deep inside the company, often who have an idea but don't have time to work on it. So we invented a concept called 20% time. And every technical person in the company is supposed to, and we encourage them, to spend 20% of their professional time on things that they find interesting, not things that we find interesting. Employee number 23, Paul Buckheit, who was the originator of the motto, don't be evil, was also the engineer who in just one day came up with Gmail, an email program used internally by Googlers. There were a lot of objections to even doing Gmail in the first place, but one of the big ones was that there was no way to make money with email. So there was this idea that had been floating around that maybe we could do targeted advertising. For example, if you get an email about um, a ski trip, it, you'll get maybe an advertisement for, for ski equipment or gloves or something like that. He decided to try writing some code to see if it was possible for Google computers to scan the Gmail messages and spit out an appropriate ad. When I arrived the next day, people were pretty excited about it and not, not always in a positive way. Some, some people were, were uh, thought that it was actually a terrible idea. What I recall from the meetings, which occurred over about a year, was this constant debate of what kinds of features, would advertising work, and so forth. And we ultimately decided to try it. And we, in fact, la launched Gmail on April 1st. It was seen largely as a joke. The addition of targeted ads to Gmail in 2004 proved to be no joke, adding to Google's ever-burgeoning bottom line. Google had transformed itself into an advertising money-making machine. Now, when we talk about publicity, the Google IPO has received more publicity than any other IPO in history. When Google was preparing for its initial public offering of stock, it had to disclose a closely guarded secret, that it had staggeringly large revenues and profits. 
It took most investment observers by surprise and made Google a very attractive stock to own. And so August 19, 2004, the first day of trading of Google shares, saw the creation of hundreds of freshly minted millionaires. Those early investors and first Google employees had struck the mother load. For people who get into a company because of the money, an IPO is a big deal. Any exit strategy, you're bought by someone else, you, you have a public offering, whatever, it's a big deal. And it causes you to rethink your life because your dream has been achieved. I'm doing okay. I'm comfortable. I am, most people would consider me wealthy. I consider myself wealthy. Larry and Sergey were now way beyond wealthy. It took just six years for them to become billionaires. Their company, Google, had become one of the world's top search engines. It's even made it into dictionaries as a verb. Google as a technological tool has become part of pop culture. And young people's perception of Google as a cross between a college dorm and geek heaven means that Google receives more than a million job applications a year. You come to Google and first time I'm really feeling like everyone knows what they're doing and they know it better than me. So just what does it take to be one of the chosen few selected to be a Google? The Googleplex, as it is known by the Googlers who inhabit it, are made to feel that they are the best and brightest. Deserving of the complimentary meals, the subsidized masseuse service, the free laundry, as well as the barbershop on wheels. I feel one of the greatest thing about Larry and Sergey, um, they were really, really smart people and they were brilliant, but I think one of, one of the best things that they've done is they also made sure that they surrounded themselves with the best and most brilliant people that they could find. Google receives more than a million job applications a year. However, to join the ranks of some 20,000 worldwide Googlers requires passage through a grueling series of tests and interviews. Yes. Uh, Rajin Seth, Ray, another Stanford computer uh, science graduate, uh, had worked Ray. at a number of high-tech companies before approaching Google. I probably went through somewhere between 10 to 15 interviews at the time. And then finally, my last interview was with Larry. And so, you know, literally I just came in one day and actually got to sit down in Larry Page's office and, uh, and interview with him. And he asked me a bunch of tough questions and uh, I didn't, didn't quite know how I did, but, uh, but apparently he liked me enough to, to the point where they decided to give me an offer. Among the most highly prized employees at Google, just after computer science engineers, are new hires called APMs, or associate product managers. A large part of why Google hired associates, like my position, associate product managers, out of school at that point, um, was to be able to culture these future product managers like myself in the way Google wanted them to behave. Mostly young, recent graduates with incredibly high test scores, they are given enormous amounts of responsibility and authority early in their career. And it's, we're not prioritizing that very hard right now because we don't think it's going to be able to replace the personal start page from day one. Among the most recent crop of APMs is a Canadian, Jeff Harris. The job that I'm actually doing, which is an associate product manager, is kind of designed for people that have a technical background but aren't necessarily interested in coding day to day. So what my job ends up being is communicating with the engineers who do code all the time and kind of just making sure that all the engineers are working together towards the same goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if the so I'm just turned 22. I think the biggest surprise that working at Google is probably how open it is about everything that we're doing. So I can just look it up on our internal site and see details on every single project that's out there, which is, which is great from an organizational perspective. Although Google might be highly transparent internally, it, like so many of the other big Silicon Valley high-tech companies, is extremely sensitive about what outsiders are allowed to report on, whether that be code on monitor screens or the doodles on the whiteboards, which are seemingly everywhere. We believe in having whiteboards all over the place, and the reason for that is to really spur creativity uh, so that, you know, you can you can draw things and communicate ideas and, and work with other people on that idea. The secure data connector here, right? 
Is our ability to publish programmatically going to be released at the same time, or is that? Yeah. And so a lot of times people will pull out their phone and take a picture of the whiteboard and send that around as an email. You know, those end up being part of the notes for the meeting. Besides having whiteboards and food stands everywhere, the other striking feature about Google offices is the absence of paper. Uh, we operate very much in, in a paperless manner. You know, one of the things that we've done here at Google is that users have laptops that they carry with them to the meetings that they're in. A lot of the note-taking is done electronically so that it can be instantly shared with people. An insatiable appetite for the new and innovative spanning a wide spectrum of technologies means Google is constantly on the prowl. But not everything, of course, is invented at Google. We also have teams looking for great technology in small companies that we can pick up, that we can buy, where they would benefit from the structure of Google. With plenty of cash and stock at its disposal, Google is able to scoop up companies it's interested in. That's how YouTube became a Google product, as did Google Earth and Picasso, as well as a web-based word processing program called Rightly. Rightly was a word processor in the browser. You just go to it as a normal website and it just works. Google noticed it because we were, you know, getting a little bit of press. Google bought Rightly and hired its founders to help develop it further. <laughs> My experience has been a little bit like I was a kid folding up little paper boats in a stream somewhere and it was really fun and, you know, Daddy Warbucks wandered by and said, kid, this is great. Here's a pile of quarter-inch thick plate steel and an army of arc welders. Go build me a battalion of battleships. Rightly has morphed into Google Docs, a word processor that moves the application and its data from the personal desktop computer to Google's servers. It, it's a little bit strange. It is strange. I'm definitely, you know, I'm a 42-year-old graybeard now, right? Like, it's kind of, I'm not that old, but here, that's 90th percentile or something. I don't know what it is, but, yeah, there's a lot of young engineers here. Um, that it doesn't it doesn't bother me. I think it's it's interesting to me. I think I've, everybody gets to this point in their career where things begin to seem obvious. I don't mind the technical culture here. I'm not intimidated by it. I'm a very productive, fierce kind of meat eating coder when I'm writing code, and they're all afraid of me. So I don't they don't bother me. It's good, it's good. I wasn't here when they founded it, but my understanding of the founding conception of the culture is. They wanted to do things and see things from an engineer's perspective. We do have a lot of people. From that perspective, efficiency might very well be an engineer's prime directive. Triage on them. Right now, I'm looking at the one where you open a text document in Gmail and it gives an error. Most of the teams do this every morning. There's a stand-up meeting. It's meant to be very short. It's about 10 minutes long. You're, you're not supposed to speak for more than about a minute. All right, so I continue unit testing. The, the pencil is the conch shell from the Lord of the Flies. Remember that? Like, so that's the whoever has the pencil is talking. That's why it's a very efficient meeting. It took five minutes to tell the whole team what was going on. Another meeting where members of the Google Docs team get to discuss problems is during their weekly rightly walk. I think it's interesting to try to do big things that change the world. I think that's what I like about being at Google. We want to change the world, too. We want to do great things. What's wrong with the logarithmic pruning that we do now? The guy was editing for eight cool. hours, and All right. the, the beginning and the end got pruned. So we were that's that's we're using it. Okay. No, no, that's cool. That's good. That's cool. You get to deal with tens of millions of users and, you know, big data centers and big machines and big engineering, and it's really fun. For computer geeks, the fun really began in 1977 in a Silicon Valley garage when two college dropouts started a company called Apple and launched a revolution, the personal computer revolution. The power of the desktop computer unleashed across millions of homes and offices around the world changed everything. But now, after more than a quarter of a century of insinuating itself into our lives, the PC has lost pretty well all of its original gee whiz luster. Google has set its sights on creating another revolution by eliminating the need for desktop computers. It wants to put as much of that data as possible onto its own servers. One of the things I think that's underappreciated is from the very earliest days, including at Stanford, they were great at minimizing the cost for putting together computer systems and they've carried on that ability to, d to deliver a huge amount of computing power uh, at a relatively low cost. 
From its beginnings, Google had made it a priority to manufacture as cheaply as possible all its servers and storage facilities to handle its fast search and logging of the internet. And as the internet has grown, so has the need for increased computing capacity. Well, Google builds large data centers. We use personal computer components, and then we build a lot of specialized systems now to deal with the kind of scale that is required. Scale is at the heart of Google. Not only does Google have access to almost limitless computer power, but perhaps of greater value, it has accumulated a massive collection of data. Data that can be used for testing at a scale unseen by most new computer engineers. My office mate and I were just banting around some ideas and, and we're talking about uh, something that later turned into something close to Google Bookmarks. And, you know, we did a little bit of math and said, hmm, that'll be about, I don't know, four petabytes of data. That doesn't seem so bad. And, and that sentence, four petabytes of data, that doesn't seem so bad, is something that before I had been at Google for a month, I, I would have been shocked to hear those words coming out of my mouth. That shocking four petabytes is the equivalent of four million gigabytes, numbers so staggeringly large that it is nearly impossible for mere mortals to fathom. As memory increases in capacity and decreases in price, Google is moving into something called cloud computing. The whole idea behind cloud computing is to go ahead and get everything on their server where the professionals are managing it. The problem today is you've got all your stuff on your computer, you drop it, you break it, you delete it, it's a disaster. Why don't you put everything that's important somewhere else, keep it secure, keep it under your control, it's available to you on every demand, on every device, and every, everywhere you are. The move to the cloud is ushering in a revolution in how we communicate, how we work, how we play, in fact, how we live. People wonder, what's gonna happen to information that is mine personally? It's my bank records, my health records, whatever it is, uh, but I don't control it. I, it's sitting out there somewhere on, I have to just trust whoever has it to not do things with it I wouldn't want. Is this move into the clouds opening a back door for governments and corporations to secretly access data about us? If everyone's digital data is moving into computer clouds, just where are these clouds? One of them has touched down in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. This was once the heartland of American furniture manufacturing. Then in the 1990s, cheap labor from overseas siphoned off the jobs, leaving behind a devastated economy and an awful lot of excess electricity. It just so happens that computer data centers are voracious users of electricity to run the servers and to cool vast quantities of water used for refrigeration. The town of Lenore had plenty of both. And so in late 2005, Google came calling, but it came cloaked in secrecy. From Google's perspective, at least as I understood it, it was that um, the race to build these data centers is so intense, and the information, at least they see it, is so proprietary um, that they didn't want any of their competitors to get wind of what they were doing. T.J. Rohr is a lawyer and a member of the Lenore City Council who was involved in the closed-door negotiations with Google. They would reveal information to us that we couldn't reveal to anyone else. Google definitely had an attitude like, look, it's our way or the highway. This is the term we're, these are the terms we're offering. Take them or leave them. Desperate local and state officials were more than ready to reach a deal that would bring Google to this devastated county. They offered Google a 30-year tax break on property and equipment. It was worth an estimated $165 million over a 30-year period. From these digital warehouses estimated to cost $600 million apiece, flows a stream of data. Here are the emails, the photographs, the music, the videos, the maps, and the searches that have made Google a data-collecting powerhouse. Google does not divulge how many server farms it runs worldwide, but it is rumored that there are some three dozen of them around the globe. 
all digitally connected and all firmly planted on land. But that might change. Google has filed a patent to build data centers out on the open sea. Powered by the latest technologies in harnessing wave energy, Google servers would sit out on barges. The expectation is that seabound servers would be much cheaper to run, and there certainly wouldn't be any real estate or property taxes to pay. A working model has yet to be built, but Google is a corporation that likes to move quickly when cutting-edge technology is involved. However, Google took its time when it came to opening up an office in China. The growth in internet usage in China is staggering. By 2009, its internet users surpassed the entire population of the United States. It is an exploding market made more complex by a censorious government. We were late in entering China. We were late because we were concerned about some of their content laws. In order for Google to set up an office in China, it had to agree to block certain sites from its search results. The Chinese government decides who gets past their Chinese firewall. To run Google in China, they landed Kai Fu Li, a senior executive at Microsoft, who was once in charge of their operations in China. In 2005, Kai Fu Li found himself in the role of Noogler, as new Googlers are called. When I joined Google, I used the word shock to describe what I felt I saw. And I think it's a combination of things. It's a combination of the Google values. And that's just how young and happy this company was. It's my goal to make the culture in the Google China office as close as possible to that of Google Mountain View office. It's impossible to make it exactly the same because the Chinese culture and the American cultures are different. Nothing separates these two cultures more than who is actually using the internet. The average internet user is 25 years old in China versus about 42 in the United States. So the difference is uh, substantial and the usage patterns is also quite different. They, the Chinese users, because they're younger, tend to like entertainment, uh, games, music, video, uh, tend to do less of searching and e-commerce. Uh, similarly, when they use the web, they tend to want something that's very busy, very, um, very exciting, as opposed to simple user interfaces. The internet cafes are filled with young people, many of whom are here because at home they would be forbidden to play these games and movies. What it seems is not forbidden, either here or at home, is downloading pirated music. We noticed that uh, most Chinese users on the internet download pirated or unlicensed music through other search engines. And um, that's become a habit, and I think most users find that to be an entitlement. So our efforts to try to build uh, perhaps a paid uh, paid per download or even a subscription service uh, ended up um, with a clear conclusion they would never take off. A Google engineer and a product manager used their 20% time to come up with Google Music, a free music download that has the support of the major record labels. So we hope we found the formula that will um, not only be successful, popular, but also profitable for record labels and for our partner and for us. While the Chinese government appears to tolerate the pirating of music, it seems to show less patience for Google, recently accusing it of spreading pornography. Google is registered in China, so we have to follow the Chinese laws. Whatever the laws are. <laughs> Well, our, our, our employees are Chinese citizens. They would have to follow the Chinese laws wherever they were. Following Chinese laws meant that Google searches from within China for such things as Falun Gong, Tibet independence, or Tiananmen Square protest produced quite different results from those that appear on screens outside of China. And that's how it operated for four years. When in January 2010, Google announced that it would stop censoring its search results due to a major cyber attack 
originating in China, targeting Google's intellectual property and the Gmail accounts of Chinese human rights activists. While China insists that its laws must be obeyed, Google warned that if discussions with the Chinese government to operate an unfiltered search engine prove unsuccessful, it could shut down operations in China. However, there were no discussions with the government of the United States. When shortly after September 11, 2001, it passed legislation that gave itself broad surveillance authority, allowing itself unprecedented access to people's digital footprint. And these powers are, are quite broad now. They range from getting access to credit reports on individuals, uh, to gaining access to their communications data, uh, to more broadly being able to send a letter to any data holder and say, please reveal all the information you have about this person and don't tell them and don't tell anyone. Uh, this is the idea of the national security letter. At the Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, DC, director Mark Rottenberg is concerned about the new digital information that's migrating to the clouds of computer server farms. I'm not saying that the government shouldn't get access to that information under appropriate circumstances. In fact, in some instances, it's, it's vital uh, to pursue wrongdoing and, and criminal investigations. But we need oversight. We need accountability. We need transparency. And the problem with cloud computing is going, it's going to make it much easier for government to engage in this type of surveillance secretly without people knowing that their personal information, their business records are being turned over. I've asked uh, people at Google to simply report statistics on how many subpoenas and warrants they get every month. They don't have to say anything else. They don't have to say what the subpoenas and warrants were about. Just a number. How many do you receive? Um, but they didn't like that suggestion and, uh, and rejected it out of hand. As the Google juggernaut plows ahead, digitizing everything in its path, it accumulates new adherence. The city of Washington, D.C. has opted to wean itself off Microsoft Office and switch to a collection of Google applications. Google's offer of a cheaper, more secure, and more collaborative life in their cloud proved just too enticing to turn down. The trust issue is central to our whole brand. If Google were to violate someone's trust, the press, of course, would kill us, and all of a sudden people would withhold their information, they'd stop searching, our revenue would go down, it'd be a terrible thing, terrible for our company, terrible for them. So we take it very, very seriously. Some people don't trust this naive altruism that, you know, we're really trying to make products that make users better. They see, you know, some sort of agenda that we're trying to, like, you know, control the world or whatever, whatever they, they, they see. But what can I say? You know, we come out of a grad school background and we don't think like that. But Google also has to worry about a band of young upstarts ready to change the world of search. Discarding Google's original model of a data crunching search engine, they are approaching search from a different angle. They want to harness the power of what was known as the wisdom of friends. I think that this is the place that um, is going to define the next several years of, of what the internet and world is really about. So why is it that some of the leading proponents of social search are ex-Googlers ready and willing to challenge their ex-employer? With almost 20,000 employees worldwide, Google, Google is beginning to see some of its early hires leaving for what they see as the next big thing. In a down-market district of San Francisco, an internet startup has an abundance of Google corporate DNA. Several of its founders are ex-Googlers. But their company, Aardvark, wants to go beyond Google and transform search itself. We, we like to call it social search. It's the notion of you're really searching for the right person um, in the moment. And, and it's not that you want to know their bio, it's that you really want to interact with them because they know something that will help you in, in your moment. Sometimes it's not really written down on a web page, but someone out there really does know the answer. And we all have social networks. Aardvark is basically a utility that, that lets you tap into that. Just down the highway, in a nondescript industrial mall in Silicon Valley, there is another social network startup, 
with its own list of very impressive ex-Googlers, including Paul Buckheit, who so famously or perhaps infamously coined Google's motto, don't be evil. Their tiny company called FriendFeed is developing a new social network service that shares and keeps track of what friends are listening to, reading, and posting on the web. None of us really knows what's going to happen next. But in, in many ways, I find that that's actually part of the fun of a startup. You know, at a big company, I can pretty easily predict what's going to happen next year. At a startup, you have no idea what's going to happen next. You know, next year could be, could be a huge success or it could be a huge failure. Google had been eyeing FriendFeed for possible acquisition. But before FriendFeed could even reach its second year in business, it was gobbled up by social network phenomenon Facebook for a reported $50 million. Facebook, founded by a Harvard dropout in 2004, has undergone an explosive growth and represents a real challenge to Google, at the same time attracting a surprising number of ex-Googlers. I think leaving Google is, and, and choosing to come to Facebook just demonstrates how uh, compelled and convinced I am about the importance of Facebook's mission. Facebook, along with Twitter, are currently the hottest social networks around, and they have realized that their kind of friend-based recommendations is a form of search far removed from Google's cold calculating algorithms. For most people, outside of engineering, the world is about relationships. It's about connecting with other people. And to that extent, Facebook really is that next step in the evolution of what really matters from a technology perspective. Google had in fact entered the social network market with something called Orkut. Although tremendously popular in India and South America, it has failed to attract any large following among Europeans and North Americans. Google really didn't jump into the social networking business, and I think that's partly the personality of the founders. I think they're engineers who, you know, small talk with your friends is not the priority. It's getting information from the scientific world is priority. So I think in some sense there was always a bias that this was sort of not very interesting, not very important. Why would you want to spend time on it? And of course, as the world has moved to Facebook and Twitter and all those things, they've said, oh, we can do that technically too. Sure, we can put Twitter-like things into Gmail. We can put Facebook-like things. We have, we have uh, Orkut. Um, but I think the heart of the company isn't in it. It's not what the company's about. It's about information, all the world's information. Google really believes that the data is going to create incredible benefit for society. The company firmly believes that it's going to find ways to use data to make our lives better, to make our lives easier, to make decisions more efficient. They firmly believe that. For instance, with flu trends, they believe that in, in tracking individual searches uh, for looking for things like cough or, or other medical conditions, they are going to detect the flu, they are going to be able to more effectively target interventions, and fewer people will die. When Google launched its IPO, Larry and Sergey personally wrote a letter explaining their aspiration for its future. Google is not a conventional company, they wrote. We do not intend to become one. Google's mission to collect all the world's information and make it accessible and useful and do it within 300 years has seen it move far beyond searching internet sites. Whether photographing streaks or digitizing the world's books or turning our mobile devices into internet portals or creating the world's greatest repository of video in its very own cloud, Google remains a technological phenomenon but its future rests on something quite unscientific. Trust, trust that it is keeping our data safe from hackers and snooping governments. Trust that it isn't misusing our information. And ultimately trust that Google is living up to its motto, don't be evil. If I ruled the world, there'd be happiness that no man could end.